Technology. Weird. Hello everyone, thanks for joining us for tonight's Thursday Night Appetizer. We're here at uh, Holy Family Parish, my good friend uh, Deacon Charles and I, and this is the Thursday Night Appetizer. Let's play the intro. All right, and as promised, the illustrious Deacon Charles Fernandez is here with me. And uh, we also have two guests on uh, on our call today. Um, if you just don't, don't mind uh, unmuting yourself and uh, saying hello, we'll uh, start with Brian. Hello, Brian. Thanks for being here. Hello. Hi, Sam, Charles, FJ, and everybody out there. Everybody out there, yes. And uh, FJ, nice to see you as well. Uh, thank you, Sam. Uh, welcome, uh 
everyone. Uh, hello, uh, Brian, and hello, Dick and Charles. Hello, everyone. Yes. So we're here together in uh, different parts of the room here. <laughs> it's a pretty tiny room, but uh, we're, um, yeah. I don't know what it's going to be like being together with Dick and Charles in a room, but we'll give it a try. Um, so for anyone who's new to Thursday Night Appetizer, we are, uh, we're here today as part of a, um, I guess a four part, um, plan for immersing ourselves in the Sunday gospel it begins with the backgrounder, which comes out on Tuesday. That's an outline of the, the reading, how the gospel and the first reading in particular, uh, mesh together. And then we have the Thursday night appetizer where we, uh, we look for lights. We, uh, we discuss that a little bit more uh, in person with our, with our guests. And we also want to hear from you. Um, and that's why we've got this, uh, great, these two great ways for you to communicate with us. If you want to participate, if you want to say anything about the reading, uh, but, or about anything that we're doing here on the show, um, this is a live broadcast and, um, we would like to, uh, to let everyone know what uh, what it is that you're saying and so you can put something in the chat and we will give you a shout out for that and you can also if you would like to call in you can uh the number is there on your screen and you can always just skip back a little bit and see that number if you have to if you're uh looking it up um also you can you could actually call in on zoom and use that number those um that 11 digit number at the end there so yes those are ways you can get through to us and uh, let us know that you're watching and let us know if you have anything you would like to say as well and uh, so those are the first two parts of the of the four part plan. The the third part is the Sunday Mass, the Sunday homily, when we hear the gospel preached, um, and we hear the homily. And then the fourth part is when we live it out, especially in the context of our small groups. So if you are new to small groups and you would like to join a small group, let us know. And you're in the Hanover area, um, we have members from Hanover and beyond. But uh, we would like to connect you with a group because that is an essential part of living the gospel in daily life. So those are the four things. And in to say, Deacon Charles. Yes. So uh, I'm really glad to be part of this. It's our second evening, as those of you who are watching and watched last week probably know. Two things. I was thinking, if you're not part of our small group, that doesn't mean you can't share the fruits of uh, the, the, the scripture as we heard it preach, we'll hear it preached on Sunday as we talk about this evening. Um, it's, it is good though to share, whether it's, uh, your, your family member, a friend, uh, we, we can, you know, connecting with someone to share the word of God is really important. I guess the other thing I want to say, which will tie into the next part of our, uh, evening is, uh, we're doing a series this Lent. So every Sunday there is a connection to the amazing theme of covenant in the Bible. And we're calling this uh, this uh, theme uh, all that runs all through Lent "Covenant Out of Chaos," and chaos is actually a word that occurs in the Hebrew in Genesis chapter one verse one. You may remember that before creation begins, the Bible says that the earth was formless and void. Genesis chapter one verse one, or words that effect, and that corresponds to a Hebrew word. That is a theme, I think, in our lives today, in our world today, and all through the Bible. It's a theme of chaos. And the Hebrew word for that is tohu wa bohu. I love that word. You can say it with me if you want. Tohu wa bohu. They can hear the, the drumming in the background. Oh, yeah. Okay. That's kind of funny. Sam and I recorded that earlier on this afternoon. Yeah. Tohu wa bohu. Uh, but it is it's actually something worse than nothing, worse than a vacuum. It means there's a kind of malevolent force all around us, um, the force of chaos, and God calls us out of the mess of our individual lives, our hearts, and our world into covenant relationship. Covenant is his gift to us. And this after, this evening we're meeting um, a really, really important person in the whole Bible. You've heard of him, I'm, I'm pretty sure, if you know the Bible at all, and that is Abraham. Abraham. Heard of him. Yep. Yep. Um, I believe that if you read the New Testament, you'll find many, many, many references to Abraham as a model of faith, um, a faith that is displayed, especially in the first reading we would hear this Sunday at Mass, which is from Genesis chapter 22, a very famous scene, probably the climax of Abraham's life, when God who has given him a son, him and his wife Sarah, a son in their old age, 
His son is Isaac, asks Abraham to go and take his beloved son, his favorite son, Isaac, and sacrifice him to God. Now, that's what Abraham strives to do. He's up the mountain with Isaac, about to strike him with the knife. And the angel of the Lord says, no, do not strike the child. Instead, there's a ram there that will be offered for sacrifice. In other words, Abraham is willing to give up not only his beloved and favorite son, Isaac, but the promise that God made him that through Isaac, the first and favorite son of God's promise, God's covenant with him, not only would Abraham and Sarah become parents of a great nation, but all nations, all nations would be blessed through them. Abraham's willingness to sacrifice the son most precious to him becomes the source of this incredible covenant, a blessing for the people of Israel, Abraham's physical children, more importantly for all nations for whom Abraham is a model of faith. Today, um, I also want to mention briefly that in the second reading we'll hear this Sunday, which is from Paul writing to the Romans, we hear this, that God did not withhold his own son. You think about it. God did not withhold his own son. Jesus voluntarily gave his life for us on the cross. He is the beloved one. And in today's gospel, which we'll hear read in a moment and briefly reflect upon with you this evening, we'll hear that God the Father calls Jesus his beloved son. And that sounds beautiful, which it absolutely is. But we can only really understand what it means that Jesus is God's beloved son when we know that God is going to offer his son up for our salvation. Jesus will sacrifice himself on the cross for us. So that's a little bit of background for today's gospel passage. That was our praise and we'll turn it over to the reading of the Sunday's gospel, Mark chapter 9, verses 2 to 10. Okay. So before we do the reading, we're just going to open, just, uh, we're going to have a little prayer. I'm um, asking the Holy Spirit to inspire us and to speak to us through his word. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Oh God, we praise and thank you for this day, and we ask you, Lord, to send your Holy Spirit down upon us. Holy Spirit, that you sent us at baptism, please bless us with your word. Allow the words of the gospel to penetrate our hearts. Speak to us in a special way. Let us hear your voice in the gospel today. Spoken to us so lovingly. Uh, given to us as a gift. We pray, Lord, that this gospel would inspire us to live out the mission of the church to be your hands and feet, to be your witnesses. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Six days later, Jesus took with him Peter and James and John and led them up a high mountain apart by themselves. And he was transfigured before them, and his clothes became dazzling white, such as no one on earth could bleach them. And there appeared to them Elijah with Moses, who were talking with Jesus. Then Peter said to Jesus, Rabbi, it is good for us to be here. Let us make three dwellings, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. He did not know what to say, for they were terrified. Then a cloud overshadowed them, and from the cloud there came a voice, this is my son, the beloved. Listen to him. Suddenly, when they looked around, they saw no one with them anymore, but only Jesus. As they were coming down the mountain, he ordered them to tell no one about what they had seen until after the Son of Man had risen from the dead. So they kept the matter to themselves, questioning what this rising from the dead could mean.
All right, so what we're looking for now is um, an initial response from everyone. This is a little different than what we did last week where we sort of had a, we began the discussion right away. Uh, but we thought it would be uh, better if we just start with one word or maybe two words, right? A phrase um, and why you chose that word or phrase coming from the gospel. And then we'll discuss it a little bit later. But um, so what's one word or one phrase that stands out um, in the gospel? Don't be shy. Oh, FJ. Sorry, I'm, I'm so used to talking that it's unusual for me to be muted. <laughs> um, so the phrase that spoke to me is, Rabbi, it is good for us to be here. Um, Peter and James and John, they were terrified, but nevertheless, they appreciated um, the fact that it was a very privilege. They were on sacred ground and seeing, when I read the gospel passage, I often put myself in the position of one of the characters, in this case, Peter, and just sort of feeling, how would I respond if I saw Elijah and Moses and uh, Jesus in this position? Um, yes. So that's more than one word. But anyways, I'll let Brian get in. Downstairs. There we go. Um, <clears throat> listen to him, God's words, I think is what I found very powerful. First, the miracle of Jesus being transfigured, but then God actually coming in a cloud and speaking directly. I thought was was amazing. So that, that was those were my phrase. Um, I noticed, as FJ, you did as well, it is good for us to be here. And it reminded me of something that's in the vision statement for Holy Family Parish, which is um, the phrase, our comfort zone. And uh, they were at that moment, though they were terrified, it was kind of like their comfort zone because um, it was good for them to be there. It was It was an incredible blessing, as it would be for any one of us, as you were saying, Brian. Uh, the word, the word that stood out to me, or the two words that stood out to me was only Jesus. Hmm. And it stood out to me because, uh, if you only have Jesus, you have everything. And if you don't have Jesus, you have nothing. And so I was just thinking that those two words are profoundly important since, uh, they looked around and they didn't see anyone else but Jesus, but really they were. They had exactly what they needed, everything that they needed. Maybe didn't know it yet. That's all. So now what, Charles? We can uh, unmute everybody, I think, and just... Unmute everybody, but... Won't Zoom explode if we do that? No, I don't think so. I don't think so either. Yeah. I would suggest when it, when it, we invite um, FJ, Brian, or or Sam or me as well, uh, just to comment on what we heard from uh, from all four of us. Just like what what comes to your mind when you remember what what each person said. FJ and I focus on the phrase. It is good for us to be here. Uh, Brian on listen to him, and Sam you focused on only Jesus. So where does that where does that leave everyone thinking, feeling this evening? how this scripture is opening up to us. Well, for me, only Jesus 
I remember that uh, Father Dave said, you can't go wrong if your focus is on Jesus, mm -hmm. having Jesus at your center of your life. And I think one of our uh, missions a few years ago, the uh, preacher said, you know, as we're growing up, um, at the beginning, we're at the center of the circle. And the idea is that that circle, the, the hub changes from me being at the center to Jesus being at the center. And I sort of, in some ways, link it back to the first reading about um, Abraham being prepared to um, sacrifice his only son. And he was prepared to do that because he had God as his single focus, God above his, his own needs, God above his own son. So in that same way, uh, he put God first. Oh, we've got another person joining here. I'm really excited about our our next uh, participant. She can't hear us yet, but she will be able to soon. Here, now she can hear us. Welcome, Susan. You are currently muted. But you don't have to be, because we're all unmuted. It is good for us to be unmuted. <laughs> so I have a question for um, Sam and, and others as well, which is, um, roughly speaking, I wonder, I kind of sometimes think, is there a danger of being so focused on Jesus that we lose sight of other people? Does that happen? Like me and Jesus sort of thing. No, because I, for me, if you're focused on Jesus, Jesus is going to be, he's there. Where is Jesus? Jesus is in me, but Jesus is in the other, the other person. And so if the focus is on Jesus, it's always going to be on the other. I was uh, cooking a meal and I thought, oh, this is, yeah, this is too much for me. And so I immediately thought, well, who could partake, you know, who could enjoy this meal? I mean, not come, but I packaged it up. So that wasn't me. That was Jesus saying, you know, you need to put your selfie side away and think of others. So now if hmm. I focus on Jesus in, in the, for me, in the very um, natural uh, um, way, then, then it's always going to lead to being there for others. At least that's the way I see it. What do you think, Brian? I'm I'm sort of agreeing and disagreeing. I guess I um I sort of thought you know I think of myself sort of like as Peter, like he wanted to build some tents and hang out with uh, Moses and Elijah and Jesus and and you know hang out at the top of the mountain. But it seemed within minutes they were on their way down, sort of on mission back into the real world and the dirty world and heading down the mountain. So. Mm -hmm much as you want to kind of hang out in the glory of God at the top of the mountain, very quickly, you're sort of on your way back, back down to do the work. And um, so maybe some would see that as, you know, focusing on Jesus and doing that work. But uh, to me, it's sort of like, oh, you know, you can't just hang out in that glory. You've got to, you've got to go down and spread the word. I know Susan can hear us now, so welcome, Susan. So nice to have you here. Thank you. Sorry, I have a dog that's having demands, so I'm like, I know I'm kind of ADD, <laughs> but I'm like hopping. But dog, I sit down here, and then the dog says, I want to go out. I want to come in. And he's making a lot of noise, so I apologize. That's fine. We're cool with it. By the way, can you, you know why we're really happy, Susan? I know, because I'm the only female who showed up. <laughs> yes. It's yeah, not a boys' I, club. That's good. <laughs> I like the won't guys. Say but... anything about her being a little late either. Oops, I just did. <laughs> yeah, well, I was double booked. Yes, I was trying. I was just talking with Giovanni in Bolivia. Hmm. Oh. He was teaching me French, but I just anyway. That's a long story. But uh, I was looking for somebody to help another student, and I was trying this app, and the app works. Yeah. So it's a it's a real life person, and he was very good. So Great. Brian said, 
can you get out of it? I said, okay, I'll get out of it. But um, yeah, can we be uh, too much for Jesus? Is that what you're, is that the question is currently? I think it was sort of, uh, can, can focusing on Jesus cause us to lose focus on other people? I think it was kind of more, more of the- Something like that. Yeah. Like just Jesus yeah. and me is enough. And that doesn't sound like being a Christian to me, but yeah, it, yet it's essential. I don't know. What do you think, Susan? Um, I liked where Francis was going with that when I was kind of upstairs checking with Brian. And mm -hmm. um, I think God and Jesus do lead us to community. I know I've heard some people I'm pretty close to say things like, well, you know, whatever God wants me to do. And I'm like, God's always given you free will. And, you know, discerning, discerning that it was Father Mike Schmitz that we were listening to with Jordan last night, who was just giving us clues on how to discern, discern. And I, I have that very much in my heart that God gives us free will. Like, what do you want? It has to be like good, solid decisions, but, you know, God wants us to have the desires of our hearts. So... I, I, I think if you're really in love with Jesus, Jesus is going to deliver you and bring you to that place where you need to be. Mm. Yeah. Thank you. You're welcome. Can I, can I just say that I think uh, you're, that when, when it's about you and Jesus, I think the focus always tends to get more onto you. I think that's just kind of the way gravity pulls uh, because we're we're full of pride, and uh, you know we're obviously we're we're weak, and um, definitely no Christians that get too focused on the, them and their individual relationship with Jesus. And yes, that's good. Yes, we do need to have an individual relationship with Jesus, but it's more than that. It's like Susan said; it it uh, it leads us to a community. It doesn't just, it can't cause us to stagnate and become self-centered. Um, or I think something I see a lot of is just the tendency to like focus on only those that, the others that we know that know Jesus and to really kind of close in. Um, I, I find that a large part of what I what I do at the church is sort of trying to break that up, <laughs> you know, to get people to, and I, I think a phrase I've used before is like, you need to be converted to Christ, but you also need to be converted to the church. And you also need to be converted to the poor. You need to be converted to see other people. It's not like something that's automatic uh, when we be, become Christians. It's it's mm -hmm. in some ways it's hard to hear Jesus telling us that, even though that's what he's saying. Look at me. I'm in all of these people around me. We make excuses, and you know, something that actually happened today. We were at a meeting, and we were talking about really important church-related things, and uh, a fellow just walked into the church. Um looking for some assistance, but also looking for people, you know, uh, kind of a lonely person and uh, someone we've known over the years, but we haven't seen for a while. And uh, it was kind of like a ray of light, like this, 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 young, this fellow coming into the, the walking into the entrance way into the narthex was like the Holy Spirit sent him there and he, he literally preached the gospel to us, which is amazing, though he needed support and he got the support that he needed. But he also preached Jesus to us, which was so amazing. It was like a breath of fresh air. Sometimes I love the, I love all the minutiae of like, how do we do this? How do we do that around the church and, you know, in our community? But when a person actually shows up, there's the face of Jesus Christ. That was pretty amazing. Right, Sam? Yes. I think it gave you hope. He saved me. Yeah. He saved me. I was feeling really, really down. And uh, when I when I saw him, I knew him from past days and hadn't seen him in a long time. And he just made me so happy. Oh, so, cool. Yeah. Brian, I was going to ask you, because this is this might tie into what we're talking about. When when you were focusing on the phrase, listen to him, God says, listen to him. Did anything come to your mind about like what Jesus is saying to us? Like, listen to him. We have to listen to him. What kinds of things might you be thinking he's saying to us today? If you can, if you can, as best you can, listen to what Jesus is saying to you, and he's saying to us, what kinds of things do you think Jesus might be wanting to say to us today? I'm not putting you on the spot or anything, but I am. 
Um, and maybe this is sort of flavored by my, I'm sure it is by my, um, just where I am at these days, but mm. uh, just really to simplify, simplify life and to really focus on his word and his, um, his direction to us to repent, to serve him, to serve our fellow man. And uh, the world is, is just, just, just so much busyness and distractions and sort of taking those away and just trying to get closer to God, but ultimately to serve other people. I, I really like the word simplify that you used. Uh, it's a great word. Um, it, it's like pushing everything else to aside except for him. And then that, that changes us. What, like we're in the middle of the season of Lent in the Catholic community. So what kinds of things, I don't know, this is for anybody really, like what kinds of things do we need to move aside that are distractions? Um, maybe it's obvious things, maybe it's less obvious things. What comes to your mind, any, anyone in the group here? Netflix. Hmm. Yeah. Social media. Yeah. It depends how you use social media too. Because for me, social media True. is my work and how I communicate with people and how I advertise what I do. Yeah. So I'm quite happy to get off social media. So it's like kind of like my more about like my nine to five. And um, yeah, it's like people would say at one point, don't use your computer. Well, now we all have to use our computers for our work. Yeah. We have someone, someone joining us. Should I let them in? Sure. Okay. We don't know who this is. But we're going to let them in anyway. It's a Huawei executive. I guess I can always kick them out if they're like some intruder. unruly, an imposter. Hello, Huawei P30 Lite. Who are you? Gosh. Show yourself. Oh, it's Ann Han. Hi, Ann. We know Hi, you. <laughs> a Huawei executive. <laughs> You're not a Huawei executive. We know you. Did you want to say anything? <laughs> No. Nope. Oh, she's muted. That's okay. Well, if, you, if you'd like to speak, you can. Can I? Oh, maybe you can unmute yourself. Hang on. There. You can unmute yourself if you want to, Anne. There we go. Did you want to turn off YouTube, though, because there will be an echo. Nope. Oh, she's muted. That's okay. Well, if you if you'd like to speak, you can. Okay, we're muting you again. Okay, goodbye. All right. <laughs> That's the fun with technology. Thanks for being on with us, and it's, it is amazing that you're here, but we got to kind of figure out these time lags and stuff, right? I know, it's weird. Um, the thing that strikes me is that Abraham doesn't just give up a distraction or an obstacle. It's like God asks him to give up the most precious part of his life, his son, Isaac. And I, I that that really challenges me to, to consider what is most precious to me that might be the thing God is asking me to give up. So I don't know what, what you guys, um, Susan, I'm going to ask you as a mother, because uh, Abraham's obviously a father. Sarah's not in this particular passage. She's quite prominent throughout the the whole part of uh, this, this part of uh, the book of Genesis. But as a mother, what might it be like to, if I ask you, what would it be like to give up your children or surrender them to God? That's tough. Yeah. That's, like way tough. Like that's, that almost makes me feel sick when I think of Abraham bringing Isaac up the mountain mm. and, you know, Isaac isn't a little child anymore. He's like, he's like a companion. Mm -hmm. That just takes more faith. And I just kind of remove myself a little bit from that because I definitely have thought of that. Like I have to really struggle to put God before my family, honestly, you know, because your family's in front of your face all the time. But um, yeah, I just figured if I was in that situation, God would give me the grace that I'd have to have to do that. Yeah. I can't, I cannot literally think of doing that. You know, when Susan, I, I think you might be able to relate to this. I, I would say that's true of Mary and I as a mother and father. 
there are times, maybe especially as now our, our kids are adults and living independently from us, which we just moved into about a, a you know a couple of years ago, where all we can do is give them up to Jesus, give them up to God, because we're no longer there as mother and father for young people whom we're responsible for anymore. So it's yeah. like, all we can just give them up to, like, Mother Mary be their mother for us, you know, God be their father for us, Jesus be their brother, because we can't do that anymore. Yeah. I totally, I totally get that. And, and when they're close to the Lord, it's, it's easy. And when they have kind of strayed, it's really hard because you just have to have faith that, you know, they're going to either come back to it or, you know, God's going to protect them anyway. Yeah. yeah it's just a huge faith. What do you think, Sam? Your, your kids are just entering that age. Uh, your oldest is 13. Yep. Just getting to that point where he's not entering, ed, entering emerging adulthood or whatever the right word for it is. He's not, he's not, he's far from being an adult, but not that far, strangely, mm -hmm. when you have a 13 year old. Do you, do you see the adult in your son, your oldest? Oh, yes. Yeah, definitely. What's it like? His voice is changing, stuff like that. And he's starting to mm, say push back. Uh, it's still fairly gentle. But uh, yeah, and easy to like resist, but uh, definitely starting. Definitely, we we notice, and um, yeah, it's it is difficult because um, you do need to kind of let go of them in some ways, you know, a little bit, a little bit at a time, give them freedom, and that's hard. It's even hard in little ways, like like Dad, can I drive the snowmobile? You know, and like that just terrifies my wife, even though it's fairly low risk <laughs> compared to you know some of the things he'll end up doing in a matter of a few years you know um but even so it's it's every every one of those steps takes faith i find anyway i'm really i'm so anxious to find out what ann joined for if she wants to say anything here i'll i'll ask you to unmute again and see if she can speak do you want to say anything Hi. ann I'm just impressed I got on. That yeah, you're incredible. here. What yeah. would you like to say to the whole World Wide Web? Oh, dear. That's a big topic. <laughs> how, how about five of us besides you? The six of us. Right. Um, I liked Susan's comment about, um, or you were, I'm going back in the discussion now when we're talking about giving up something that means a lot to you. Mm hmm I've had, last year, one of my granddaughters said, so what are you giving up for Lent? But I'm more like, um, one of you mentioned that, I think it's Pope Francis said, it's more about what you do, not what you give up. So I've been trying to do, and mm -hmm. it can be challenging, but I like it better. I, like that I thought... I thought of giving up social media, but that's how we keep in touch with people I've met on mission trips in other countries. And it's a link to communication to them and to my family. So I don't really consider that an option. That's all I have to say. Thank you. You're on mute, Sam. Are you talking? All right, I'm trying to do ten different things here at once. He is. He is. <laughs> yeah. I'm just wondering if I could share sure. uh, what Pope Francis did say. I've got a little um, the quote from him. Just bear with me one second. I'll just get it up on the screen. I feel like I've exercised a lot of faith by letting FG, giving FJ permission to broadcast his screen. It takes a lot of faith. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Sam. Uh, so for me, of that list that he gives you, uh, for me, I guess the one that 
really speaks out um, is um, right at the very bottom. Fast from words and be silent so you can listen. Mm -hmm. For me, that is the one that's going to be the hardest. The one that really strikes me for myself and I think for so many people I know is fast from grudges and to be reconciled. I mean, sometimes for me, a grudge is something like I, I almost like care for like a plant, I let it grow <laughs> and water it and feed it. It's like, it's kind of, oh, I know it's bad, but it's like I almost derive a weird kind of pleasure from that. And it's so sad. It's really destroying you on the inside, right? Me on the inside. Um, but isn't it amazing? Like, I don't know if you guys have experienced this. I have um, moments of reconciliation and, and they could be just in the course of a day in our, in our families or friends or coworkers. Sometimes it's years. I've been talking to different people as this happened in my life as well, where sometimes it takes years of prayer and healing before a friendship or relationship can be reconciled. And it is what a gift when that, when you see that begin to happen. So I, I feel like that's such a powerful one. Thinking about like how we make the things that are beloved really sometimes it is our own sin, so sadly. Mm -hmm. It's a good one. Because when I first read it, I thought, oh, I don't really have that problem, but I, I really do. This is really great, FJ. I, for me, it's fast from pressures and deep be prayerful. I really like to have a lot of things to do. I like to, I like to be doing so many things that I can't really slow down. And so, I mean, I like to keep it simple, but at the same time, I have this natural thing that just wants to see me spinning. Mm -hmm. And I, I shouldn't be that way. So I think Lent is a good time to just say, really keep it simple, sweetheart. Kiss. Kiss. I wonder if, if I could ask all you wonderful people out there, uh, we're getting towards the end of our time. We ha actually had a great comment. Um, Sam, do you want to read that one? And then I have a question for everybody to kind of yes, help us wrap so up. This is from Ted in the, in the YouTube chat. I think that the act of letting go of our own will has to be practiced in all the little things before we can be like Abraham, willing to give up his son. And I was thinking about how that relates to Lent mm -hmm. and what uh, FJ just put up there. That uh, That's really the purpose of giving up, giving up. And also, I mean, giving up and doing something of the same thing. You know, when you, when you do something extra, you're giving up, you know, time from, you're taking time from something else. Mm -hmm. um, so they're, they're really two sides of the same coin, but um, that's what we're practicing in Lent is giving up our will, right? Saying, Yes to God in a little thing, maybe just something small. And and by doing that, we, you know, hopefully when it's when it's asked of us, we can uh, show the kind of faith Abraham had, willing to give up his son. Wow. Um, what faith that is. Anyway. Yeah. So I have a question. Maybe we could wrap with this. And I want to I like to ask people hard questions because I feel like I get great uh -oh. answers. Um, Here we go. Because we're members of a community and it's a beautiful community. I love being Catholic. Um, I feel like God is continually asking us as a church community to give things up for the sake of his mission. Um, I wonder if, if you, you guys have any thoughts or feelings about the kinds of things we're being asked to give up and for the sake of what greater good that God wants us to move and move towards. What mission? Like they've got to leave the mountain and go down into mission in, in the gospel passage we heard. So... Uh, advice for us, reflections uh, as members of a church community that, that's called to give things up and move into mission. What do you think we need to give up? What what kind of mission are we being called into? Mm, great question. You really stumped everybody. <laughs> Maybe. Oh... Sam? I think uh, what we're being asked to give up is the past, hmm. not tradition, because we need we still need tradition, but maybe our our understanding of how things should go and how things should be, and 
um, that kind of thing. The baggage, let's say. Mm-hmm. That God is God. I think in our community, I think in, in terms of the mission, God wants to do something new. And it's always new. It's not like it, it's ever supposed to get old. Um, anyway. I, I think it's actually a sign of gratitude towards those who've gone before us in our faith, in our immediate families, in our church communities. We We can be grateful to them by letting go of what they've given us because what they had to do in their time was embrace something new. Like I think a lot of the pioneers, the first Christians who came into Gray and Bruce, they gave up their homelands and they really had no idea what they were getting into. And they embraced the new call that God had for them here in Gray Bruce. And they gave us beautiful things, some of which we'll retain, but some of which we need to say, okay, that, that was what they were called to. But in our time, we've got to let go of some of those things. Um, I would say a one word summary of what I think we have to let go is uh, some writers refer to Christendom, that the sense of like that our whole society is Christian and isn't that great, which it was. Um, but on the other hand, by giving that up, what, what can we be called into? I kind of feel like it's we're called into excitement of being on mission again, because we can't make that assumption that everything and everyone around us is Christian. It's hard to do that. I'd love things to be back to the way they were when I was a kid and even in my young adult, but it's not like that anymore. Anyone else have any thoughts or reflections on that? Advice for us as a church? Giving up our, our comfort zone, which is really in the, in the mission of our church. But it, it really is, uh, we're so comfortable, you know, just inside the confines of our church and within our community and people we know and love, which is great, but, you know, to get uncomfortable and go out and I still really struggle with that. I'm definitely not there yet, but I, I think it's an exciting process to get closer, closer and closer. Brian, what's the promise you think God might have to offer you and us as a community when we do that? Because he's always leading us to something newer and more exciting than where we thought we were. Well, I think really it's, it's living out love of neighbor, love of another when you introduce them to God or, or help them grow in faith, come closer to God. So to me, it's just how you can, how you can live out your love of your neighbor. Hmm. Whenever I um, see a program on TV that I'm watching, um, my immediate reaction is I'm thinking of somebody who I know who would enjoy this program. And Mm. if it's an acceptable time of day, I will ring them up and say, you know, if you turn to channel such and such, this program's on because you want to share that. Um, So in the sense of sharing my faith, I want to do the same thing. I want to say, well, this is what, uh, how, why it's so important. It's so central to my life. And that um, uh, I was, I was sharing with uh, the Exodus group that I was reading an article that said that in Japan, uh, over a hundred thousand people a year go missing. Hmm. And these are people that, I mean, that basically have lost hope. They've lost their job. It's, and so I'm saying that when you focus on Jesus, seeing the hope that he gives to you and eternal life, but the joy. I mean, when I encounter people that are joy-filled, and some, of course, are not Christian, um, uh, but when I experience that, my first reaction is, I want to have that too. Mm-hmm. And so you want to share it. You want to share something that's important and that is, yeah, has importance in your life. Anne or, or Susan, do you want to add anything? We're going to wrap up shortly, I think, Sam, but we want to make sure we, we hear from you if you want to add anything at uh, just sort of your own reflection on us as a community, what what we are being called to give up, what God is calling us towards that we haven't yet embraced. Go ahead, Anne, if you have something, I'll speak after you. You can go ahead, Susan. Okay. I'm still thinking. 
Okay, well, what came to mind um, with what FJ had proposed with the do something and from Pope Francis was looking for the less fortunate and, mm -hmm. and caring for them. Mm -hmm. um, this pandemic has forced us to, to kind of stay in our homes and has forced us to, to be in our comfort zone a lot. Like, it's almost like I'm doing a really good thing by staying home, you know, stay home, stay well. Get out there. There's this person who walks by our door. Often he's like freezing. Like, let's give him a hat. I mean, it's just a very simple thing, but Brian, do we have mitts? Brian gave his mitts up, you know? And of course, you know, the next day or so he didn't have it anymore, but there are people out there who are just really struggling. And I, I know there's a group developing something called God in Grey, where we can actually go out and get out of our comfort zones and offer a hot drink, offer a word, a kind word. I think, I think today that's what we're being called to do in my mind. Thank you, Susan. That's awesome. It's inspiring. We, should we mention the comment? We got a comment on yeah. YouTube that uh, in the answer to the question, uh, what, what does the church need to give up? And Ted says, self-righteousness is crippling to evangelization. Self-righteousness. Hmm. I think that's a good one. Want to make sure we catch Anne before? Yeah, we got to let Anne up. go. If Anne, if Anne wants to add anything, you don't have to, Anne, but we'd love to hear from you if you want to add anything. This no, evening. you do have to. Okay, Sam says you have to. Am I unmuted? You're yeah. on. I think um, it's important to not just sit back and like Susan says, you get very comfortable in your little zone, staying home, cooperating. But I think you have to, you have to push yourself out. You have to call people. You have to mm -hmm. notice people. And that's difficult when we're trying to follow the expectations that we're trying to self-isolate, it's hard. Like I saw two people a couple of weeks ago sitting in a snowbank in Chesley eating a lunch they must have bought at the food store. But what are you going to do? I don't know. Like they were older. It was, uh, we didn't stop, but I guess we probably should have and asked them, can we help? Can we give you a ride? Even though, I don't know. It's hard. It's hard to notice and to yeah. do. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's really hard. So Thank good you. work with the mittens, Susan. <laughs> the hat. <laughs> hey, little things like, like Ted was saying in the comments earlier, the little things we do, those little gestures can help, help us grow with the Holy Spirit leading us. I mean, none of this is possible without the Holy Spirit. What Abraham did even before the Holy Spirit was given at Pentecost was obviously in the Spirit, that moment of surrender to God. And that's, I think, I know we're all called to everyone is individually and all of us together. So maybe we should wrap up in prayer for this evening. It's a great opportunity that we've had to share the gospel of Jesus Christ and each other's witness and testimony. So thank you all. And uh, maybe ask, turn it over to you, Sam, to, to wrap us up. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. We'll close with the glory be. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, the Son to the Holy and Spirit, the Spirit, as it was as it in the was beginning, in the beginning it's now and ever it's shall, be. Ever shall be. be, world it's without world end. Without amen. 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 All right, so I want to say thank you to everybody for joining us tonight, and uh, especially those who joined us on YouTube, and those who will watch this uh, undoubtedly after it's been recorded. And uh, we thank you for joining us. We will be here every Thursday during Lent. Uh, this is going to be a regular event for us, and uh, we are learning together, growing together, and living out the gospel as one. And uh, thank you for joining us again. Can't tell you how appreciative we are. And uh, hope you bring a friend with you next week. Yeah, bring a friend. Bring a friend next week. And last word to you, Deacon Charles. Um, I think the chaos is all around us. I can I can hear it in in the sharing from myself and from everyone here. 
and within us as well. And isn't it amazing to know that God sees us as his beloved and reaches out to us with the offer of covenant, every single one of us and all of us together. Like it's his, it's his gift, the gift of his son, Jesus Christ. Amen. All right. Thank you very much, Deacon Charles. And uh, God bless everyone. We'll see you all next week, if not before. Bye. Everybody wave. Goodbye. Goodbye. That didn't work either.